Hi, I think we better get started rather than hang around anymore. I'm conscious of time. And I just want to make sure I can be seen by the camera. The camera's all set up. Hello, everyone at home watching on Zoom. I think we have about 30 people at the moment that are watching at home, taking it easy, and they're able to tune into the presentation. There's 100 people here in the Deaf Heritage Centre, lads. They're all screaming their, their applause at the moment. Beautiful atmosphere. Uh, I'm only kidding, but thank you very much for joining us here uh, at home. Or sorry, rather, thank you from jo thank you for joining us here from your homes, and thanks to everyone who's here in person tonight as well. So I know that time is pressing on. I do have a habit of waffling when I present. The time just flies away, and I don't control my time management. I'm going to try and keep it to an hour, maybe an hour fifteen minutes this evening, and then after that. Yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely right. Yeah, I do actually have a timer on my phone to control that. Yeah, but afterwards, then I will accept questions and answers. And for people watching from home, I'm going to uh, I'm going to switch off the recording and I, I won't be recording any of the questions and answers. But after the presentation, as I say, we can have a discussion. I'll stop recording. You can ask questions. I'll give answers. And then we'll try our best for the people watching at home. If you want to ask a question, you can type a question in the chat window or you can switch your camera on and give the question in ISL and we'll have that up on the screen for everyone to see and then I'll answer those. OK, so I'm going to officially start my timer now. Sorry, I'll go back a slide. Right, okay, I just wanted to first say welcome, thank you for coming to my presentation, which is about my thesis, my PhD thesis, which I began all the way back in 2014, and recently I submitted into Trinity College Dublin. So that process is finished, and I suppose what I wanted to do at that stage was invite the deaf community to a presentation where I explained what that thesis is, what it found, some of the data, etc. Now this is a very summarized version, I've had to work quite hard to get it down to this short length and the full thesis is just too big to present the whole thing. So I'm giving you just a very selective view of what's in that dissertation, okay? I just might look away from you and towards the PowerPoint every so often. Actually, could you hold on a second because there's something here in the room that just needs to be changed as regards the projector. Yeah, we need a plasterer, all right, to make that portion of the wall completely smooth for, for the projector. OK, sorry about that. So just a little bit about how I started the thesis. I started back in 2014, but even before then, I was very interested in deaf history, especially prisoners and workhouse inmates. I had find I had found so much information about deaf people in those settings. And at that time, I took those discoveries and I did presentations in the Dublin Deaf Club in Tala around the country about deaf prisoners, especially. And I need to thank Alvian Jones and John Bosco Conema for helping me present at that stage for those local presentations. So then in 2014, I decided I wanted to take, I wanted to take my study of this area a bit deeper. I wanted to do it in a PhD. So I registered with the Trinity College in February 2014 and began my PhD studies. Now, I do have to say that I didn't get funding from any source to cover my costs. Through the eight years of study, I paid my own fees. So this is money from my own pocket. I'm not annoyed about that or anything, but, you know, I could have used those savings to buy myself a fancy new car or to help towards a house deposit or something. But I think it's worth it when I have the PhD dissertation done, you know. So I began more in-depth research for the PhD. And I thought a lot about how to share those findings with the deaf community. I didn't want to research all this information and keep it to myself. I wanted it to get out there to deaf people. And I did that in various ways. I had my own website as well as a Facebook page. I used Twitter. I kind of have withdrawn from Twitter, Twitter since, kind of fed up with it, but I did use it at the time. And I wanted to use ISL vlogs primarily. I didn't want to have pages of text going out about the, the findings. And even if time was tight, I'd produce information first in ISL and then add subtitles or voiceover afterwards. And then what I 
decided to do was anytime I presented about a particular topic, I presented deaf audiences first in ISL. And following then that, I would present to hearing audiences on that topic. So the deaf community received that information first. Anything new that I found out, any fascinating new developments, the deaf community would get them first. What I've also done at various history conferences where I talk about Irish history, I signed up for several of those, but I didn't want to present a paper about deaf history while speaking. So I signed my presentations to these hearing audiences in ISL, but I used a voiceover in English that I had pre-recorded. So I'd play that out loud, hearing audiences could hear and understand that, and then I would sign in ISL. Because I wanted to show that you can use ISL in academic contexts. You can use it to present on academic history. So it's not just about English, but ISL as well. This is an example of that, this photograph. This is a good while ago. This is a, a conference held in England all hearing audience members, but I presented in ISL with a hearing recording of my voice being broadcast or being played so that everyone could hear that. And I'm doing the same on Wednesday. I'm flying to Wales for a, car a conference in Cardiff where I will again present in ISL. Okay, so the research continued for eight years and it was very hard going. It was quite stressful. There were obviously work and personal life things going on at the same time. Managing those were, were was, very, was very difficult. And anyone who'd been through the PhD experience would encounter this. I definitely encountered this. And at two different points, I said, look, this is just temporarily too stressful. I'm going to go off books. I'm going to pull out of the process for a little while. And then when I felt ready to do so, I came back to the studies. And then in March of this year, March 2022, I was about ready to submit until I caught COVID-19. Now, at the time, the message I got was, don't worry about it. You're going to get a month's extension. Trinity College were willing to give me that extra time. So I thought, this is grand. Extra month to finish this off. No, no, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Because back in March, I, was, I, was, I had done 100,000 words already, but I needed to go back and with a fine tooth comb, go through all the details of what I'd written to make sure it was okay. So to have one extra month to do that was fantastic. The problem was the Viva Voce interview that was due to happen was then put off a good while as a result of that. So I haven't done that yet. I'm not technically yet a doctor because I haven't done the Viva. I've submitted the PhD, but not been, not had to defend it yet. So 100,000 words, hi, how you doing? No problem, no problem. I do have to mention as well, you might be wondering about that picture. So on the left is the front page of my PhD thesis that I submitted. And beside it, the same night that I had submitted the thesis, I didn't have time to submit it. I had to submit it that evening. So it was quite stressful. I think it was about 10 to midnight that I finally thought to myself, yeah, this is done. This is finished. So I submitted it electronically and that was that. And obviously I wanted to celebrate that stressful day, that big achievement. So I poured myself a, a pint and I have some cupcakes here as well, made by Amanda Mohan, my partner, who's here with me tonight. And that was to celebrate the fact of submission of the thesis. So I had to take a picture to remember that really important moment. And you know, whatever happens about the dissertation, sure, even if it fails, it was a lovely night, that feeling of completion and having, having that achievement under my belt. Now, I'm sure you know the second person pictured here, Dr. John Bosco Conama, of course. John Bosco Conama, oh, oh, sorry, someone in the audience doesn't know who John Bosco Conama is. His name is Dr. John Bosco Conama. Uh, maybe some people out there don't know who John Bosco is, even though, even if we do. But I suppose initially I did think I would love him to be involved in the project as a supervisor. You know, the supervisors assist you through the process. And then you have Patrick Gagan. He's the first individual pictured here, an expert in Irish history, uh, the 18th and 19th century in particular. So someone had mentioned Patrick Gagan. I approached Patrick and I approached John Bosco and they were both delighted to be supervisors. Hi, how are you doing? 
Oh, yeah. Maybe more people than you, or more people joined later than you on Zoom. So you don't need to worry about, about being the last person to arrive. Don't worry, it's fine. But the two, anyway, worked with me as supervisors. We made a great team. We would have meetings with interpreters. And so in those meetings, I would speak to Patrick and sign to John Bosco. So I'd be speaking and signing, depending who I was talking to. I felt sorry for the different interpreters that were involved in those meetings at times because they weren't sure what language I was going to use next. But it went quite well and it was good to see those kind of links happening and collaboration between hearing and deaf historians as well. So these are the different chapters within the thesis, and I'll give a little summary of each of these here this evening, not too in depth. Obviously with 100,000 words, that's impossible, but I'll give you a little flavor of each of the chapters. Everyone at home can see me okay on Zoom, no problems? Great. So the first chapter is an introduction. I won't go too much into that here this evening. I suppose I talk there about the deaf studies area, deaf history, disability studies and disability history and so on and so forth to kind of set up a background, a context for the rest of the thesis. So for a hearing person who'd never heard of deaf history that didn't know the difference between capital D deaf and small d deaf, it's all there in that introduction. So just to talk a little bit now about my approach, how I went through the PhD process. First of all, I did have to consider who are this group of people in history that I'm looking at? I suppose initially I thought the deaf community, capital D deaf, but in the 19th century, the word deaf had a very, very different meaning. So deaf would have been used to describe people who had a, who had a hearing loss. But I'm specifically looking at deaf people or people with some kind of hearing loss who used sign language. And those people were described using phrases like deaf and dumb, or even just dumb itself, which was shorthand for deaf and dumb. You might think, oh, it means maybe the person can still hear, but actually most of the time it meant deaf and dumb. Sometimes you might see the phrase dumb only, which means can hear, but can't talk. But on its own, to describe someone as dumb, was short for saying that they were deaf and dumb. And then as I say, the word deaf in this period that I'm looking at didn't mean deaf people who could sign. It meant someone who was raised hearing and maybe lost their hearing later in life. So you do have to think that the terminology that we use now for these categories and back then don't always match at all. So I decided to include people described as deaf and dumb or deaf mute, but then also not to describe people who were described as only being deaf. Just to talk a bit about my own conceptualization of deaf history as not being separate from Irish history, but just like anywhere else in the world, it's inter intricately intermingled with hearing history. You can't separate the two things out. What's happening within the deaf within deaf history can't be isolated from the developments in the wider mainstream society. That's why I use this phrase, deaf history is Irish history, and Irish history is deaf history, because what's happening outside influences inside, but what's happening inside the deaf community is important to Irish history too. It's not a heavily theoretical PhD. I use what I call a general deaf studies perspective, which means that we accept that deaf communities use sign languages, they are real languages, there is a deaf sense of identity and community, these things that we're very familiar with. But it's not that I take my favorite model and uh, try and apply it to my findings from 150 years ago. So I call it the theory light rather than the theoretically heavy, which makes it easier to understand and maybe easier to analyze some of the things I'm finding also. What I do use is a history from below approach. And maybe you're familiar with this idea that 
you know, in the past, deaf history would often talk about the founders of schools like the Christian Brothers, the Dominican nuns, uh, you know, oh, they did great work for the deaf community, aren't, weren't they fantastic? But it doesn't really have a critical, in-depth look at their real role in all this. Deaf history sometimes covers deaf people themselves, but quite often we'll only look at the elites, the better off deaf people, the upper classes, the middle classes, the ones who achieved quite a lot. It doesn't really look at the rank and file of the deaf community, you know, particularly when you look at people who are poor, who broke the law. I look at all those areas of the deaf community. Now, we don't have very many accounts of deaf people writing about their own experiences and their own voices. So you have to try and use the sources that you have to reconstruct that image of deaf people's lives. And I'm very interested in agency and resistance. But what do I mean by that? Well, of course, deaf people did suffer oppression in this time, as they still do now. Well, I think it's fair to say the oppression was far harsher at the time. But I focus on what the individual does in response to that oppression. Do they just take it? Are they passive? Well, no, quite often they resist and they resist in several different ways. And that's fascinating to me. And I tend to background the workings of the system that oppresses. I think it is important to understand the workings of the oppression, of course, but I prefer to look at the person who is being oppressed and to see what they do when faced with all these barriers, all this oppression, what options are open to them and what they decide to do in response. There's also some ethical considerations that are important. Now, the deaf individuals that I would have researched have all passed away long since. That doesn't mean that you're free of any ethical obligations. You're talking about people who were put in prison, put in mental hospitals. A lot of hearing historians would say there are sensitivities around this. They change the names of the individuals that they write about. I made the decision that I was going to use the real names of the people I talked about. And one of the reasons why is this is something I saw in a lot of newspapers and books. A deaf person's name would often not be used. They would be described as just the dummy or a deaf mute. Maybe they had a real name, but at the time the writer didn't even bother to find out what that was or to write it down. They were just described as the dummy and so that their identity is cast aside in that way. So I felt that it was better where possible, where the name was known, not to anonymize the name or, or to shorten it, but to use deaf people's real names. And then the last point here, engagement with the deaf community, like I've already mentioned, I didn't want to be researching all this info and gathering it, all these resources and keeping them to myself. I wanted them out there within the community. So where do I get my information from? Well, you can see my sources here. There's lots of different sources. And just to say back in 2014, when I started my studies, I was thinking, well, what period should I cover? And initially I said, well, 1816 to the 1950s should be possible. Yeah, this is gonna be great. But the more I researched, the more I realized, look, this is too much information. It's way too wide a span. You know, um, 170 years or so was just impossible. So I talked with my two supervisors about this area and they said, look, it is better to reduce that period. So in the end, I decided 1851 to 1922. I was able to do that detailed targeted research in. So basically pre-independent Ireland, Ireland still under British rule. And it's interesting because 1920s onwards would be a really interesting period to focus on, but that's the period that I selected for this PhD. And I very much believed in taking an all Ireland approach as well, because at the time there wasn't a separate Northern Ireland partition hadn't taken place. England governed Ireland as one unit. So you have to think about Northern Ireland not as being separate or different, but as part of that one unit to see how Ireland uh, did during this period. Okay, so the next chapter of the thesis talks about deaf education and language. And I'm sure you know that there's been quite a lot of literature published about deaf schools in the past, about the Cabra schools and Mary's and St. Joseph's. We do have deaf studies literature that talks about those institutions. 
Now I did find some new schools and units I'd never heard of before. So for example, Tralee in County Kerry apparently had a unit. This is from the 18, you know, the 1860s, 1860, 1865. But there was a unit of a school in Tralee that used sign language. I didn't research that in depth. I just came across it, mentioned it in the thesis very briefly. One important thing is that during the period 1851 to 1922, Ireland would have had between five and 10 schools for deaf children around the country. And the vast majority of them used sign language. Some described their approaches using a combined approach, so speech and sign. Belfast would very much have been one of those, speech and sign language. The Cabra schools, St. Mary's and St. Joseph's, obviously very much sign language using schools. Most of them used sign language. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the 1880 Milan Congress, right? Then that announcement, that resolution that was taken, that sign language should be used less and oral, uh, the oral approach should be used. That didn't have very much impact in Ireland. It wasn't a rule anyway. It was just an advice. It was kind of a message. We have got together and agreed that this is the best route forward. Irish deaf schools just ignored this and kept using sign language. And in 1889, there was a royal commission that looked into the area of deaf education and they decided that oralism was the best route. But again, in Ireland, the schools just kept teaching the way they had been teaching. What's interesting is there was another school, Rochford Bridge in County Westmeath. The Sisters of Mercy ran that school. Uh, 1892 is when that opened. And it used sign language. There was a bit of speech taught there as well, but it was mostly sign language. So all these schools using sign language, it was, I mean, Ireland was a country where in deaf schools, sign language was used. And there was a letter that happened to be signed by the, the principal of the Belfast School, the Cabra Schools, some of the other principals of deaf schools in the UK. This letter was a public letter that said oralism is not the, is not the way to go. So it looks like Ireland generally as a nation agreed that they were going to keep using sign language. And the only exception was the Claremont School, the Protestant school in Dublin. They did very rapidly change to an oral system of education, but you have to think that around right about 1881, 82, there was very few children being taught in Claremont. It wasn't very influential anymore. Them changing wouldn't have inspired other schools to change. So Claremont changed to oralism and everyone else kind of went, well, we're sticking with what, with what we have done for the past while. So you have all these different schools all around the country in Ireland. What about the sign languages? Was it the same sign language that was, used, that was used all around the country? Well, no, there was considerable variation and complexity. I mean, now it's very easy to say, well, ISL is used. It's not really possible to say that the same way 150 years ago. I don't actually use Irish sign language in my thesis. Of course, obviously we have ISL now. But what I say is, at the time we had cabra sign in male and female variants, which over time merged and blended to become ISL, but at the time they were quite separate. And also, we do need to talk about what was happening in Protestant schools like Claremont, Belfast and Strabane in Northern Ireland. And there was a few other smaller schools as well. They had very strong links amongst each other in terms of teacher movements and pupil movements. And that meant they used a form of BSL at the time. But I call it Irish BSL, a particular kind of BSL used in Ireland. So Irish BSL is the label I use in my dissertation to talk about that. It wasn't the same BSL as they used in England. It, was, it had a particularly Irish flavour. It was used for years and years. You know, while the, the Cabra schools used Cabra male and, sign, male and female sign variants, Irish BSL was used. Now, Northern Ireland still uses Irish BSL. And again, it's still very different to the BSL used in England and Scotland, but it, it disappeared from the rest of the country. And then also, of course, you've got deaf people who never went to school. People who were never educated, who used a lot of you know, what people often call home sign. But I find that quite often that's dismissed and people say, well, that wasn't a real language. But I know that there has been recent research done in countries like Mexico. I suppose what you call global south countries. And they've found quite a lot of these isolated villages where there's quite a high percentage of deafness and you know, have large families of deaf siblings. 
that sign amongst each other. They're not educated, but their sign language actually has grammatical features and they're called village sign languages. And I feel myself that Ireland had a situation similar to that years ago. Because in the west of Ireland and the south of Ireland, you quite often come across these families with three or four, maybe even five deaf children. And they would have their own sign languages. And you can imagine that each new child that came along would add to the complexity of this language. And I think what you've got, got going on is these village sign languages. And I've also found traces of uneducated deaf people that never went to a deaf school, but they demand or be provided with an interpreter in a courtroom situation. So there's a complexity to the language situation in Ireland at this time. So you've got all these deaf schools being set up around Ireland. The numbers going into the schools rises. And you can see here, this is data taken every 10 years of how many children had been educated up to that point for each of the schools. So we can see those numbers increasing each decade. One really interesting thing is that people don't often focus on Belfast. They'll often talk about Claremont as being vital. But the numbers in Belfast really did go up very rapidly in this period. Up to 1911, the pupil numbers who've been educated in Belfast were beating Claremont's. So Belfast actually had more pupils that had gone through that school by 1911 than Claremont. It's a really important school to look at, the Belfast one, just in terms of the sheer amount of children attending there in an Irish context. But the biggest deaf schools actually in the UK at the time were the combined St Mary's and St Joseph schools of Cabra. So you're talking something in the region of 3,600 pupils who've been educated there by 1911, huge numbers. So in 1911, how many deaf children had been educated, had, had gone to school up to that point? 6,135 is the total. So there you go. But what we have to remember as well is that, you know, you've got deaf schools, that's great. But in terms of deaf literacy rates, they don't see a very rapid increase. It's a very, very slow changeover. Just having deaf schools didn't necessarily mean that all deaf children went to those schools. That changeover happened incredibly slowly. So you can see the blue line here represents educated deaf children. And that only becomes the majority of the deaf population right about the turn of the century, right about 1900, is when most deaf people in Ireland could read and write. But for most of the 19th century, that number was the minority. Most deaf people couldn't read and write. And why is that? Well, I have a few answers. I think they're answers anyway. So just to talk a little bit about this photograph, it's from the Dublin Deaf Club sometime in the 1920s. I found it in Contact magazine. I thought it was a brilliant photograph. So I thought I'd stick that in there somewhere. Now, just to say that at the time, I believe there wasn't just one Irish deaf community and maybe some people wouldn't agree with this, but I think there were deaf communities. I think there was a Catholic community and a Protestant community and there was separation between them. Now, it looks like that there was a certain amount of politeness between the companies. It wasn't a bitter kind of separation, but there wasn't widespread socialising or mixing between deaf Catholics and Protestants. What's interesting is the deaf Protestant community seemed to get more mainstream attention in the newspapers, what was happening in their deaf clubs, what activities. You'd see quite a lot of press coverage of this and very, very little of anything going on with the Catholic deaf community. So social attention the protestant deaf community was far better at, at, at gaining like the media like the newspapers would mention what was happening in protestant deaf clubs but the catholic deaf clubs would never print in the newspapers a summary of what was going on what events were coming up and the papers were full of this kind of thing for protestant deaf clubs and i often think that that contrast is really interesting 
Now, at the same time, Belfast had a good amount of mixing and uh, mixing between communities. It wasn't strictly separate. There was an Ulster Mission Hall in Belfast. It was really a Church of Ireland Mission Hall, but it welcomed Presbyterians as well as Church of Ireland deaf people, Methodists, other kinds of Protestants, and Catholics were welcome as well. So everyone seemed to come along to the Mission Hall. I've looked at lists of members and it would list them by religion. The Church of Ireland members, the Presbyterian members, and Catholic members too. And some houses in the Belfast area Deaf people seem to share accommodation. You might have a household with a Catholic, a Presbyterian, and a Church of Ireland, uh, three deaf people living together. So there was a bit of a mixing going on between religions in Belfast that you didn't see as much outside Belfast. There was a bit more separation. Interesting stuff. So you had the Catholic deaf community, but then within the Catholic deaf community, men and women were very strictly separated as well. Now, of course, they started off being educated in different schools, St. Mary's and St. Joseph's, but that separation seemed to continue for years and years. So yes, you had the separate schools that deaf Catholic boys and girls would grow up in. They had different sign languages after that. That made it hard to communicate between them, but also think about what they did for work. Think about the work patterns. Deaf men would become cobblers or tailors, and quite often they would move from place to place doing that work. They'd go here and there around the country. Deaf women then would often be sent to institutions for work. So for example, hospitals or convents, those kinds of places. You can see in the census, it's really quite interesting, these groups of deaf women working in these institutions around the country, a group of five over here, 10 over there, eight, it's really interesting to see the, the existence of those groups of women, but of course it made it harder to meet a husband. At the time, servants weren't encouraged to do that, and of course it did happen, but there was that you know, pressure not, not to meet men. So it's harder then to even to meet a man. And of course you've got separate deaf clubs, you've got separate religious retreats for deaf Catholic men and women. You've got all these layers of separation. That didn't happen with deaf Protestants. Men and women tended to mix fairly freely. And that really affected the deaf community, I think. I think that's a huge factor, and we'll see a bit more about that. What's interesting as well is where deaf people decided to live. A lot of them decided to live together. You, you quite often find maybe three deaf siblings living together, a sister and two brothers, let's say, without any hearing people, or maybe with one or two hearing members with them. Or, and especially in the north of Ireland, you know, often have deaf housemates, deaf people who just, just decided to live together. So this is just talking a little bit about deaf community and deaf culture and how that expanded through this period. You know, drama, performances, deaf sports, you know, founding deaf teams, you know, Dublin versus Belfast, or Dublin versus, you know, Catholic teams from, let's say, Glasgow. Lots of this stuff going on at the time. Dramatic performances as well, theatrical performances that the public were allowed to attend, hearing people coming along, being very interested by the sign language performances. This happened in both Belfast and Dublin, by the way. So you can see deaf culture starting to blossom and spread. And of course, there was oppression that affected deaf community life too, hearing people more reluctant to bring on deaf staff members. And in Belfast, obviously you had the shipyards at the time, a huge source of employment. And deaf people worked in the shipyards too, but there were some cases of discrimination. Employers not wanting to hire deaf employees. And at one stage, an MP got up to make a speech in Parliament to talk about one case of a deaf person being denied um, a position. And there was a particular missioner called Francis McGinn, I'm sure some of you have heard of him. He was a Corkman originally, but then he ended up in Belfast and really became, uh, you know, through his mission work, central to the deaf community, fighting for deaf people's rights, uh, you know, encouraging um, deaf people to be giving, to give, given employment. And there was a growing hearing interest in sign language as well during the time. Now, I don't think any of that was to do with awareness of knowledge of grammar and facial expression, but there was certainly a huge interest in finger spelling, especially the two-handed finger spelling, not so much one-handed. But hearing society loved the idea of learning the two-handed alphabet and using it. And some people, when they became fluent, 
seemed to say, well, now I'm able to interpret for deaf people. And it did happen. I can show some examples of that later on. And this is from a good while ago. And you can see Francis McGinn here. He's the guy with the moustache, the, the bald guy. He was deaf himself, and the gentleman uh, sitting beside him was deaf also. The guy in the very left is Benjamin Payne. I think he was from Cavan originally. He was a deaf teacher. He moved to Wales to become the principal of a deaf school there. And there was Francis McGinn. And this was showing on the front page of the newspaper, the Northern Ireland signs for evening and telegraph. I think that's the way it looks, that sign. But what's interesting is that this was showing to the hearing world these examples of signs. So sign obviously wasn't considered to be uh, bad or a waste of time or stupid. This is, you know, the newspaper was willing to publish this on their front page. And then the group photograph is a group that were soon to head off to France for a world meeting, a world conference of deaf people. So this is showing some of the Northern Ireland group that were about to go with some American delegates. And again, the paper willing to print and publicize this. So both these examples though are of Protestant Delf, deaf Belfast people. And the, the deaf Belfast community seemed to be able to get the public's attention in a way that the Catholic deaf community in the South just didn't or couldn't. And I, I'm still wondering as to why that is. But I think you can just see the difference between the Protestant deaf Belf Belfast community I suppose, more outward facing, getting far more media attention than the Catholic deaf community, even though the Catholic deaf community, of course, is numerically far larger, but there was just that discrepancy in terms of public attention. Just to talk about deaf marriages for a little bit. So this is from the 1901 census, people all over the country hearing and deaf together what percentage of them were married? 37.7%. So what about deaf people? Any guesses what the percentage is? One or two percent, you say? 30%, zero percent, 0.5 percent. Okay, let's have a look. So it's far lower, isn't it? It's quite a low percentage. What's interesting, if you look at that 8.8% .8 and separate it out, into deaf Catholics and deaf Protestants. What, what do we see? So Protestants, I mean, the number of deaf Protestants who married is still lower than the general population. It's about half of it. But deaf Catholics, the percentage is very small. There is very few deaf Catholics getting married in Ireland at this time. And if you think about what that means to build a community, that ability to meet, to form relationships, to marry, to have children. If they're hearing that they will learn sign language as well. If they're deaf, you pass on your language, to, language and culture to them. That's all interrupted in the Catholic deaf community because of this low marriage rate. So huge amount of data and figures here from the 1901 census. So information about where do deaf people live in Ireland at the time the numbers in different counties and how that changed through time as well. That information is there too, but I won't go too much into depth into it. Overall, over the period, the number of deaf people declined, but then again, so did the overall population of Ireland because of emigration and a whole host of factors post famine. But some of the areas you saw rises in deaf populations. So one area where you saw these rises was County Antrim, but really it's because of Belfast. And there's a huge increase between 1861 and 1911 of deaf people there. Absolutely phenomenal. It, it, it almost quadruples in size. Whereas at the same time, Dublin City, the number of deaf people stays relatively the same. It doesn't see the huge increase you see in Belfast. Now, obviously, there was lots of new jobs in the shipbuilding and other industries that became available in Belfast. And... Lots of people moved to Belfast, deaf and hearing. So there's a huge population increase anyway. But the deaf population of Dublin City stays pretty much the same. Now, also in Belfast, 
what I find interesting is that most of the people in the deaf community in Belfast are from either Antrim, Down or the surrounding counties, whereas deaf people in Dublin are from all over Ireland. They're from the west, they're from the south, they're all coming to Dublin and circulating with each other there, whereas in Belfast it's more of a regional hub rather than a national one. They're coming from Antrim, Down, Armagh and so on, but not so much from other counties further afield in the way that Dublin and its deaf community was composed. So my research showed some information around who deaf people were living with in 1901. And you see this category here. 14% of the deaf community were living with other deaf people. And that could be a household that had, say, three individuals, maybe one hearing and two, you know, two deaf people, a brother and a sister. But what it meant is, whatever the configuration, if there was someone else deaf there in the house, you had sign language at home. And then you've also got an equally big proportion of deaf people who were, who were at deaf schools at the time. So 28% of deaf people had sign language where they lived, but of course over 70% then did not. Whether they're hearing, families, new sign language, bothered to try and communicate is unknown. But 14%, I think, of deaf people living with other deaf people is quite high, I think, and I think it shows a willingness a desire to live with other deaf people. So who are these gentlemen in this group picture here? Well, this is one of the boards of guardians. At the time, boards of guardians had responsibilities for administering the workhouses. They would collect a local tax and they would spend it on workhouse costs, and, they, and sometimes they would make sure that poor people were given cash as well. Occasionally you would see a female guardian later on, but mostly these were men, and they became responsible for deciding whether deaf children could be funded to go to deaf school or not. In 1831, there was a new law passed for Ireland, where a new national school system was established for hearing children. So they were able to evade a free, uh, avail of free local schooling, which was great for hearing children. The situation was different for deaf kids. They could go to the local national schools, but they wouldn't be able to understand the speech around them. And the deaf schools weren't registered as national schools. They weren't covered in terms of funding, which means at the time, deaf schools existed, but if you wanted to attend, the family had to pay a fee. St. Mary's, St. Joseph's, Claremont, the Belfast School, these were all established on the same basis. The government didn't supply funding for this. Basically, the schools were left to fend for themselves. In 1843, then, a new law was passed where these boards of guardians around Ireland were able to pay or to contribute towards these fees for deaf kids to go to deaf schools. Now, it wasn't compulsory. They were empowered to do so, but it was not compulsory. So it would be great news if the Board of Guardians were willing to fund this. But Boards of Guardians were quite mean in the sense they were very conscious of expense. And if they refused to pay, then the family was still stuck. And that became a huge problem after 1843 was the attitude of Boards of Guardians to this. What often happened was that parents would end up paying half fees and the Board of Guardians would pay the remainder. But if the Board of Guardians thought that you were a particularly deserving case, that might be more willing to pay. If they perceived you to be well able to pay yourselves, you might not get a thing off them. So it really depended on their perspective of your own situation as a family. So you can see that over time in Ireland, the Boards of Guardians did end up spending more and more money on deaf pupils to go to school. So money was given to families, they were assisted, their children did go to school, and you see the number of pupils being covered increases. And for Cabra, the schools of St. Mary's and St. Joseph's, they became very dependent on Board of Guardians funding. So other private charitable donations were quite small, or there were less than what was needed. And so they ended up going to the Board of Guardians quite a bit. So over time, you can see that in some years, the new children coming into the schools 
maybe 100% of them were funded by the boards of guardians and the numbers paid for by families themselves or privately was very, very small. So the board of guardians became the chief source of money, but this was public money that was being depended on to keep the schools going. So there's a lot of detail here, but just to say that the boards of guardians, one of the biggest problems here first and foremost, was that the government didn't necessarily clarify what it meant, like what level a family had to be at, you know, beyond which they could be assisted, or there was no kind of clarification, no criteria. So it was all very vague. It was left to the Board of Guardians to decide themselves, look, you decide if you think that the family is poor enough. So the Board of Guardians would find out what the family earned per week, Sometimes they give some funding, sometimes full funding, sometimes none. If the child, the child's family will be questioned about how much land they occupied, if any of their other children had employment, how much money was coming into the house. Lots of questions. And then the local newspapers would often publish the proceedings of these meetings in the local press. So their own, their, the family's financial business became public. A lot of families didn't want that. You know, so, so in those occasions, the children would not be sent to school. Some parents became very assertive to say, I'm sorry, I pay my poor rate. It is my right to have my deaf children educated. I want my share. But the guardian still had the power to say no. So. Sometimes if a deaf children, you know, if a deaf child wanted to be sent to school, they had to come into the workhouse stay there for one night. Now we'll talk about workhouses later on, but the workhouses were terrible places. And you can imagine a child who spent their entire life up to then at home in a comfortable house, having to go and sleep in a workhouse ward for one night just to fulfill the official purpose of, okay, now they're registered, we can pay for them now. And the Board of Guardians were obsessed with value for money. If a deaf child was sent to school, they'd ask for regular reports. How are they doing? Are they getting on well? And if the reports seemed to indicate they weren't doing so well, the guardians could vote and agree to withdraw the child out of school. And that mean, means their education was finished. If a child, if it didn't work out and the child came back, then the next time a deaf child applied to be sent, the board of guardians said, well, there's no point in that because the last child we sent, they didn't work out. So, so there's no point sending them to the school. Also, the term of education could change. They were meant to go to school for six years, but sometimes the Board of Guardians would only pay for a year or two. And that meant that they came home without full literacy, maybe without full fluency in ISL or, or Irish BSL. So this was a big problem. And if you look around Ireland, you'll, feel, you'll see that different Boards of Guardians acted differently. There was about 130 Boards of Guardians. And then... Boards of Guardians like North Dublin and South Dublin, uh, you know, each, each large town would have had its own Board of Guardians and its own workhouse. And some areas were even more reluctant to spend this money, especially in Ulster. They were very unwilling to pay the money. Now, in the South and the East, you'll find that most Boards of Guardians were fairly willing to part with this money. I'm not sure if you've seen Graham O'Shea's work on this. Well, he did some analysis into the unions in County Cork. He found that the Board of Guardians in Cork City were far more willing to pay than some of the rural Boards of Guardians who thought it was a waste of money, they wanted to know where their money was going to go, and they often refused to pay. So you'd see those patterns and that variation around the country. So this makes it very clear, if you're looking at the four provinces of Ireland, the boards of guardians in Ulster, far less willing. And I know that obviously the number of Catholics in Ulster proportionally was lower, but this takes into account that. And still they were far less willing to pay for deaf children to go to, at least to go to deaf Catholic schools. Now, I think it was pretty much the same in Ulster, regardless of the religion of the child's family, whether they wanted to be sent to a Protestant or Catholic school, there was still that discourse around the expense and not being willing to pay. And if they weren't willing to pay, quite often it meant that the child didn't go to school. They were illiterate. They didn't have fluency in a sign language. 
So can you really say that they're part of the deaf community? Can you say that a deaf child who's only been in St. Mary's or St. Joseph's and is withdrawn after a year or two has full literacy, full fluency in sign language, a full member of the deaf community, or is that process interrupted? So if you look at total figures of who went through St. Joseph's and St. Mary's, it can be misleading. How, how strong, how coherent is that community of people because of these factors? So some pupils, as I say, were withdrawn early. Now, what you also had in some cases were children arriving at the schools and teachers very quickly realizing that this child, because of maybe learning difficulties, they weren't able to be educated. And that number rose, I think maybe because the staff in the schools became more expert at guessing when they could actually teach children. And quite often, what would happen is that they'd be sent only for religious instruction. And then they'd come back and they might kind of work on the farm. Quite often they might come back and would have to go to the workhouse. So that affected the deaf community too, in terms of how many deaf people were literate. You didn't see that quick rise in literacy. It was actually quite slow because of these factors. Did you have a very strong, coherent, uh, well-connected deaf community with all these factors? You know, I, th I think it did have an effect. So these would have been pupils that would have gone to school but were withdrawn early. This happened quite a lot in the 1860s, 1870s, and less as time progressed. But what you'll see next is pupils who were found to be so-called incapable of being taught by schools when they arrived, and that number increased. So I think over time, you, you'll see that increase. I definitely feel it was because St. Mary's uh, and the Dominican brothers and St. Joseph's became more familiar at gauging when a child arrives, look, we're not able to educate this child. Maybe at the start, they'd be more willing to, to try it out and let the child stay a few more years. Later on, it was a case of, no, I'm sorry, we can't do this. And they would go back to, the, to their home or to the workhouse. And obviously the schools couldn't take on everyone. They couldn't just accept every single child or adult that was sent to them. But once they were full up or they couldn't do anything, then the child or adult was sent back to their home area or to the workhouse. Okay, so the next topic is workhouses. I'm sure some of you know what workhouses are. Obviously, it's for people who are very poor. They don't have employment. They need to survive. So this is the last option is to go into the workhouse. Now, a lot of people believed at that time that you were sent to the workhouse. You were forced to go into the workhouse. This isn't the case. People had to decide to go in. So there wasn't that element of force. But what's interesting is that a lot of deaf people in the past did use the workhouses. And I'm interested in why. Why did that deaf person decide to go into the workhouse? What was happening in their lives? What was their situation that made them enter the house? So that's what I've looked at in the dissertation. And in my research, I found that both in Ireland and also England and Wales, when you look at the population of workhouses, there was a very high proportion of deaf people in there. Small, absolute numbers, but a very high proportion of the deaf community were workhouse inmates. So deaf inmates were given work to do. And a lot of the time, the boards of guardians thought they were good workers. Now, at the same time, they were often the target of ridicule and derision, but they weren't seen as unable to work. But there was a particular part of the workhouse that, were, that was called the lunatic ward. It's basically like a small mental hospital attached to the workhouses. And sometimes if there was poor communication with the deaf person or difficulties, they would be placed there. And sometimes they'd stay in these lunatic wards for many years. The blue bars here represent the general population, hearing and deaf, what proportion were in the workhouses. And the red is the proportion of deaf people in the workhouses. And each year, you can see that massive gap. It's a very high percentage of deaf people in the workhouses throughout this period. Whereas the proportion of the general population goes down to quite a low number. 
So I had a look at the patterns of deaf people going in and out of the workhouses. What tended to happen? Did deaf people use them often? Did they stay for a long time in there or did they go in and out, staying short times each time? And there were deaf people that went in once and stayed for years. I did find those cases, but I also find, found cases of deaf people who continually went back and forth into the workhouse for short periods at a time. Sorry, just Teresa Lynch has asked me just to explain a little, a little bit more about what workhouses were. They were institutions. Now, they don't exist anymore. You'll find a lot of them in Ireland were converted to hospitals. But let's say you had no money, you didn't have employment, you needed to survive, you needed to get by in life, you didn't have any other options. Your last option was the workhouse. It was somewhere you were able to, yes, yes, you're right. At the time, you didn't have social welfare. You didn't have the dole. You didn't have any kind of government benefits whatsoever other than the workhouse. That was where you went. So you could sleep there, you'd be provided with regular meals, but the conditions were terrible. The food was awful, the bedding was freezing. You know, you'd be sleeping in a ward with lots of other people beside you, people who were homeless and, and so on. So, and you were given work to do as well. Now, quite a lot of people, if they were physically unfit or very elderly, they wouldn't be given work. But if you were physically fit, you would have to do this as part of your stay. And a lot of deaf people would have arrived. They would have been judged as well able to work and given some work to do rather than a decision that, oh, they were disabled, they can't work. No, they were, they were given work as deaf, deaf inmates. So why did deaf people go to the workhouse? Was it just because they were deaf? Was it because they were not able to work? Well, no, actually, there was a host of reasons, and we can see some here. Homelessness was one reason. A lot of deaf people, a lot of people would tramp all around Ireland. They were called tramps, and they walked here and there. They slept rough, or sometimes if it was too cold, they might see if they can enter the workhouse, and they would be admitted, generally. You see the picture of the man here, the photograph. That's a great photograph that I found from 1925, and it's a deaf tramp. He himself, he was deaf, but he was obviously well able to look after himself and his journeys around the country. He would have perhaps stayed in different workhouses for a day or two at a time. He'd stay in one and then leave, go to the next area. And at the time, a lot of these tramps, deaf and hearing, you know, maybe they loved freedom. They didn't want to stay in a, in a job or a house. They just wanted the freedom to roam the country. So this is perhaps one of them. Sometimes it was lack of avail availability of work. Maybe it was seasonal, seasonal patterns in work. Maybe come autumn and winter, the work would die down and they'd find they had to come to the workhouses. Sometimes it was about security. They'd be regularly fed, they'd have accommodation. Maybe going outside the institution, they'd be facing oppression and all of the kind of dangers. Maybe there was a security for deaf inmates. But also medical care. This is a big thing because, well, workhouses also had free medical care. So whether you were poor or what your level of income was, you could avail of this medical care. And deaf people, deaf people did that. So in 1901, 24% 20, of deaf inmates were in hospitals, or so were in workhouse hospitals. If women were pregnant, but unmarried, no support elsewhere, they could go into the workhouse for medical care. Now, this wasn't particularly high standards of, of care. They were particularly kind, but it was medical care of a kind. And I have found deaf women who entered the workhouse for this reason. They gave birth to their child in the workhouse and then either left with the child or left their child in the house when they left. And mental health is another very big factor. So you've got the lunatic wards attached to the, host to, to, attached to the workhouses as well as the hospitals attached to the workhouses. And in 1901, 30% of deaf inmates of workhouses were in the lunatic wards, so which indicates potentially mental health problems. Thank you. So Ireland had, as I say, 130 to 160 workhouse unions all around the country. And most of the register books for these workhouses have gone, unfortunately. Now, in the north of Ireland, a lot of them still exist. But elsewhere, so many of them have disappeared. So I went through the workhouse registers for these unions, 
So I tried to have a mixture of urban and rural unions. A lot of them are in the north because plenty of the registers still exist. Now, I know that Cork also has a lot of registers that still exist, and Graham O'Shea has looked through a lot of those. I just picked this selection here. Now, some of them have gaps. So between 1851 and 1922, some of the registers would be missing. So there's gaps. This is just some statistic or some, some data rather from what I found out. If you'll see the second last column here, the one that's labeled longest stay in years. Yeah, so the longest stay in years means Deaf people entered that particular workhouse, and some of them stayed for many, many years. But it would depend which workhouse. So the first one there, the workhouse in South Dublin, one deaf person went in and stayed for as long as 44 years. The next one down in Rathdrum, this is in Wicklow, a deaf person went in and stayed for 57 years. So it means pretty much that they died in the workhouse. But also, I suppose they've got security there. They're going to have regular meals. They're going to have accommodation. But it wasn't a nice life. It also didn't mean that they weren't allowed out. They could leave. But maybe some deaf inmates didn't want to. They wanted to stay. They wanted the security. Or maybe they had a mental health problem, in which case they couldn't leave. So, of course, deaf people went into the workhouse. It's a bad experience for anyone who has to stay in there deaf or hearing, but it was worse for deaf inmates. So think about communication. Officers are using spoken language that deaf people didn't understand. If deaf people hadn't been to school and the written workhouse rules were illegible to them, they couldn't understand them. What I also found was a lot of deaf people who wrote letters to the Board of Guardians when they were in the workhouses complaining of their conditions or the quality of their food. So they were making written complaints. And some of the letters really have beautiful standards of English. And sometimes there were advertisements for work positions within the workhouse, like a porter or a carpenter. And some deaf inmates said, well, I'm able for that job. And they'd, they'd make written applications. So there was one deaf woman in Galway who I think became a ward's maid. It's kind of like a basically the top position for the, the, the women looking after the wards of the workhouse, and a deaf woman got this position in Galway. But for deaf women also, there were particular risks in the workhouse. Sorry, just clarifying the sign I used for maid. Yeah, I've seen that sign before. I don't know if I'm right or not, or I, I've just seen it before. But for women, yes, it could be a terrible situation. They could become pregnant. Male staff could exploit them sexually and... I found five deaf women who became pregnant in the workhouse. And this always led to a scandal. Who was the father? And there were inquiries and the deaf women were asked who was the father. And some of the five deaf women had never been to school. They were not educated. And so they didn't understand the written questioning. They weren't able to indicate clearly it was him or it was, it was him. Some of the women had been educated, but it, it had been so long since they left school and sometimes the, the questioning in writing was complicated and the written replies they got didn't make any sense to those making the inquiries. And so their evidence was dismissed. So it was very hard to identify who it was that had committed the rape or committed the sexual um, exploitation. And mental health was a huge thing as well. So you had deaf people staying in the workhouse maybe for many years. Quite often they became violent, lost their temper, assaulted other inmates or officers. And after a while, if this continued, medical advice was sought to see, you know, can we get this person certified as insane? And if we can, we can get rid of them out of the workhouse into the asylum. But quite often, a doctor would say, I'm sorry, I can't certify him as insane. His, his, his sanity is, is there. He's, he's, he's sane. And this was frustrating for the workhouses because, the, you know, the, the deaf person would still be losing their temper, would be violent. Again, medical certification couldn't be got because he'd be found to be sane or she would found to be found to be sane. The workhouse wasn't an institution that suited deaf people for all the reasons I've talked about, but neither was the asylum. So they were kind of caught between two stools. And years of this 
could actually eventually lead to authentic mental health problems. And so the deaf person did suffer mentally, did get certification as not being sane and were transferred to the asylum. Okay, I'm gonna go quite quickly now through what I found in the courtroom. So deaf people going into court, that could be as a defendant or as a witness, or there's various different roles that they would play. Overall, I looked at, was it in the newspapers, 1,139 cases where deaf people were involved as a defendant or a witness or, or whatever. Most of these cases are criminal cases some are civil cases, so, you know, suits um, either against or by the deaf person. And then there was also inquests where deaf people were brought in as an, inqu uh, as an inquest, inquest witness. So 1,000 plus cases in total. Okay, so deaf witnesses were in this period able to give evidence in court. But prior to this period, there was a lot of questioning about whether a deaf person could understand the oath. You know, could they understand the whole notion of to tell it the truth, uh, the whole truth, but so help me God kind of thing. So they had to show proof of intelligence, proof, proof that they had use of sign language. But sometimes they had to satisfy the judge. And if the judge wasn't satisfied, then they weren't accepted as a witness. And it became more easy in a kind of strange way because witnesses would in Ireland quite often when it came to taking the oath, they would take it and then they would kiss the Bible, right? So it looked like deaf people would see this and then they would come up to give their evidence and they'd kiss the Bible and that would be taken as proof. Yet they understand they don't need to say the oath. So the judge was satisfied if they kissed the book that they understood the meaning of the oath and, and all that it meant. When deaf people themselves were defendants, the judge and jury sometimes took pity on them. If they were found to be guilty, the sentence that they received might be lighter than usual. So a smaller fine or less time in prison. Oh, they didn't understand what they were doing. And, uh, you know, you know, their, their sentence of the treatment would be would be light, lighter than if they were hearing. So there was so they were maybe treated a little bit better out of pity with this assumption that they didn't fully know what they were doing. What's interesting, though, is for a deaf defendant, when it came to them having to plead guilty or not guilty, deaf people, if they didn't understand this process whatsoever, what it meant to put in the plea, and there was continual miscommunication, then legally the court could say this person is not sane and they could be put in a mental hospital. And maybe they weren't guilty. Maybe they were arrested and it came time for the courtroom to ask, how do you plead? The deaf person didn't understand what was happening. And just because of the miscommunication, they'd be placed in, in a lunatic asylum. And that's really important if you're talking about a deaf person who wasn't educated, they, they weren't literate. Just on the basis of the communication, they could be placed in a mental hospital. So that did affect the situation for deaf people. There were interpreters in Irish courts for deaf people, but it was not like it is now with high quality standards and good training. Family members were often used, police constables, teachers of the deaf, all these different categories. And there were deaf interpreters. I found examples of deaf interpreters. So the first one I found was from 1862. A deaf interpreter was used. And what happened was that the judge and the barristers would write questions for the deaf defendant to this deaf interpreter. He would sign to the deaf defendant and write down the deaf defendant's answers. It was all done through writing. There wasn't a need for a hearing interpreter. And the deaf interpreter in question had been educated in St. Joseph's. The deaf defendant was arrested. He was uneducated. And so this deaf man was brought in to ease communication. So that's one example of deaf interpreters. And then finally, to say that the use of writing by deaf people as time went on became more common. So literacy was increasing among deaf people. And I feel at the time that because interpreter quality was very, very variable, maybe a lot of deaf people preferred to be more clear and to communicate in writing. And also, of course, the standards in Cabra of literacy were very good. So maybe deaf people trusted the written word more. It wasn't full access, but, you know, anything's better than having to use that fella as an interpreter, you know. Maybe it's the same today. Now people don't trust interpreters still. <laughs>
So from my research in the newspapers, I was finding that quite a lot of the mention of interpreters didn't mention who the interpreters were or what the relationship was to the deaf person, like were they a family member or a colleague? It was very confusing. So you'll see quite a lot of people in that category here. There were policemen being used as interpreters. I don't think they signed fully. I think they fingerspelled. I think they learned the two-handed alphabet and fingerspelled everything. And of course, for some deaf people, they didn't understand this at all. And what the policeman would say is, well, he doesn't understand me, so the problem's with him. And quite often the blame would be put on the deaf person for not understanding. And the policeman would say, no, I interpreted faithfully. I, I fingerspelled everything perfectly. It's his fault for not understanding. So there was no awareness of the difference between the ISL and signed English and fingerspelling. At the time, it was all just considered to be the same thing. There were very few CODA interpreters, children of deaf adults. There were some, but most of the family members used as interpreters were siblings. And I think at the time, with very few deaf Catholics being married, therefore not having children, in most cases, that's the reason for that. And then you can see that over time, the use of writing increased. So you'll see that slow increase of deaf people using writing in court. I know I'm a little bit against time here, so I'm going to try and go through this quite quickly. One of the things I found fascinating was in this period, 1851 to 1922, deaf people using the court system for themselves, for their own reasons, to bring someone to court who had mistreated them, to, I suppose, showing more agency and determination. So what you might have had is, let's say a deaf person was in the dock there with the defendant, the defendant had the right to cross-examine the witness. And deaf defendants were allowed to say to witnesses, sorry, now you saw you saw you say you saw me at this time, but what time is it really? You know, this kind of thing. Deaf defendants did this too. So a deaf person might be arrested for larceny or drunkenness. A witness might say, Yes, I saw the person doing XYZ. The deaf person would write down a question for them to say, You know, you saw me at this time, but I wasn't actually there. You know, they were actually using their agency to defend themselves. And then you had civil cases where deaf people were taking the cases, maybe against their employer for loss of wages or for wages owed. And some of these deaf people weren't, weren't literate. They'd never been to school. I've seen these records of deaf people taking hearing people to court and the deaf people were, were, were not literate. I assume there was some support there from friends and family or maybe other deaf people in the area. And I found a couple of examples of deaf people assisting others with legal issues. And then what you have are what are called private prosecutions. So it's another way to bring people to court. And deaf people used private prosecutions and that system. So they weren't just subjects. They weren't just being affected by court proceedings. They took court proceedings and were active litigants. So when you're looking at court proceedings with deaf people involved, I found so much to do with gender and so many hardships that deaf women had to face as reflected in the courtroom. So rape, sexual assault, cases like that. I really have so much information about this. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. I won't go into too much detail about it tonight. But one thing I will say as well is that deaf women who are unmarried would often become pregnant. And you found that they abandoned their children or they were accused of infanticide. One deaf woman, you know, or some deaf women were forced into prostitution. There was also seduction cases. These are quite interesting. This isn't a criminal case, but let's say you had a girl that works in the farm. Her father is a farmer, is giving her various bits of work to do around the farm. She becomes pregnant, and maybe it's another one of the workers who lives on the farm is made pregnant. The father sues him for seduction because of the, because of the labor he is missing because his daughter is pregnant. So if the suit was won, the alleged father isn't imprisoned, but he is fined. Because the father is saying, I'm losing out on, on earnings because my daughter is pregnant because of you. And those happen quite a lot with deaf people. So there's all these different gender factors associated. And you definitely see this coming out in the, the, the legal area, the, the court. Okay, this is the last section. 
uh, deaf people in prison. I've, I've given presentation after presentation about this uh, around the country. I'm sure you're sick of hearing about this. But in Ireland, you had what was called a convict system. So if the person committed a serious crime, they would be given a particularly heavy sentence, four years plus. But that was a specific system that they then had to go into. So they went to Mount Joy Prison, first of all, for just under a year, by themselves, solitary confinement, essentially, for that period. Then they went to Spike Island. And what you had was education and other things, but it was still a very, very hard system. And I found deaf people who'd gone through the convict system in Ireland. So this is a list of the prisoners. But these are only the prisoners who were given sentences of penal servitude, this particularly heavy kind of four years plus uh, sentence. But there were lots more deaf people that served shorter sentences in prison, six months or one month. These are just the ones who went through the, the penal servitude. They were the convict system. And that means there's lots more information about their life. I have copies of letters that they wrote and so on. So these are those individuals. So this is an example of one of those convicts. This is James Brennan. So you can access files for each of those convicts, how long they spent in prison, any punishments they received, their behavior, information about their health, and also letters that they would have sent to the government asking for leniency or a shorter sentence. And what I find fascinating is the correspondence that these prisoners entered into. And you can find actual letters that they wrote or a register of the letters that they wrote and what it was about. So like a summary of each letter. And deaf people did use letters quite a lot after they were put into prison. They would send letters to the prison authorities complaining about their conditions or the quality of their food. Sometimes they had health conditions that they begged for assistance with. Sometimes they were asking the government for a shorter prison sentence. So there were all these kinds of letters that I found, all these examples. Okay, so fantastic sources. But some deaf people, I know for a fact, did not attend a deaf school. They were illiterate, but I was finding records of letters and actual letters apparently written by them. And I think what was happening there was either that prison staff, like warders or guards, had some sort of communication with the deaf prisoner and were trying to write on their behalf, or maybe family members who regularly came to visit those prisoners and knew their sign, their, their way of signing, would write the letters for them. Or it's possible that maybe other deaf people were helping in that, in the, in that way as well. It's, it's not entirely clear. But mental health was another massive issue for deaf people in prison. And you'll see that quite often. Deaf people becoming violent while in prison, being transferred to the mental hospital, but the mental hospital declared that they're not insane. They returned to the prison, the prison authorities trying to get certification. And this, and this going on for years and years and years, leading to actual mental health problems. So for example, one deaf woman prisoner wrote, wrote a letter, and I'm gonna show an extract of it here, where she is talking about how difficult it is for her to be in prison and was asking to be released early. So you see an extract of it there. I'm tired of being lonely in here as a jailbird. She's using the phrase jailbird here in her letter. What I find is interesting is that woman herself was from the States and then she moved to Belfast and she got into lots of trouble. And Francis McGinn, the local deaf missionary, became fed up with her. She was always asking him for help and assistance, and he wanted nothing more to do with her because she kept stealing, and especially from other deaf people. And so Frances McGinn eventually said, right, that's it, I'm done with you, I wouldn't assist her anymore. So she had a hard life in the end. Okay, so conclusions, and I'm almost finished then. So I found that Irish deaf history is hugely complex.
you can't say that anything was the same for all deaf people. There was just so much variation between Catholic and Protestant, between men and women, north of Ireland, south of Ireland. There's just so many layers to this and there's no easy answers, none. And religion, especially between Catholic and Protestant, was very consequential. It wasn't the case that Ash or everyone just got along together and uh, experienced the same thing. It's not like it is now when religion isn't important. It was very, very different. And in England, maybe it wasn't as big a factor as in Ireland, but here it was huge. And of course, it was always going to be huge in Ireland because religion and bitterness between religions was very, very serious. And this obviously influenced the deaf communities here too. Gender was also huge. You had that segregation between Catholic deaf men and women within the deaf community. And I think if there was that willingness to mix more and less segregation, you might have had a stronger Catholic deaf community, but you didn't have that. Instead, you had that separation and maybe that made the deaf community and the Catholic deaf community easier to control. I don't know. I mean, that's just a, a theory I'm throwing out there. Deaf children's access to education was not always equal to hearing children's. I mean, national schools were there for all hearing children. Deaf schools existed, but you had to pay for them. And that payment was often a huge problem. The Board of Guardians decision was very consequential there. Mental health is another massive theme. And it's really come up in every single chapter that I did. Mental health is just an absolutely huge connecting thread through all of the research I've done. And it's a real pity because the mental hospitals, the lunatic asylums, initially I did want to look through their records and case books and include that, but I just didn't have the time. I had to leave that out. So that's a topic, that's an area that's wide open if any of you are interested in researching it yourselves. In terms of institutions like workhouses and mental hospitals and the workhouse lunatic wards, those kinds of institutions, the proportion of deaf people was far beyond what you would have expected it to be. Not so much with prisons though. I found that the sentences that deaf defendants would receive would be lighter because of pity for deaf people, but in other kinds of institutions, just really dis disproportionately represented in them. But deaf people, displayed agency. They didn't just sit down and take it. They reacted and resisted against that kind of power. They made decisions. They showed agency. I think I've found so much proof of that. And let's, let's look at some examples. They defended themselves in court by using interpreters, using sign language, or by using writing. They initiated the cases in court themselves. They brought people to court. They sued others. They used the workhouses as part of their own ends if they needed a place to stay like they weren't dragged off to the workhouses they weren't placed in workhouses they chose to they used the workhouses for their own meat their own ends when they, when they were in the workhouses they would write to boards of guardians to talk about concerns they had or if a job opportunity had come up they'd apply for the job and if they were prisoners they would use their correspondence to write to the prison authorities or they'd write to the government to the crown to ask for a shorter sentence so they were doing this themselves. They were showing agency. They were showing the ability to fight their own corner. These are just some topics that I don't think are covered and really should be in the future. So definitely, I would say to everyone, if you have any interest in these, these are wide open. And I do think these need scholarly attention. We need to research these topics. I think there's lots of evidence and materials out there. I was really surprised at how much I found when I started looking. So the next step for me, first of all, on Wednesday, I'm flying out to Wales and presenting there to that hearing history conference. I've then got the Viva Voce interview, after which hopefully I'll become a doctor officially, but I still don't know when that's happening. It's been delayed since when I got COVID. It kind of threw, threw the whole timetable out of whack. I know there's going to be two examiners. One is, one is deaf and one is, one is hearing. And I'll obviously have to plan for that quite intensively when I find out the date. If I pass and actually get awarded the doctorate, my thesis becomes public and all of you are more than welcome to read it. And I'm very open to criticism. Or if you say, look, Sir Cormac's produced a piece of rubbish here. I'm going to write my own book about this topic. Absolutely. Go right ahead. I mean, I think the key thing for me about history is debate, discussion, 
as long as it's evidence based, we have to accept sometimes that we that we're in the wrong. It's all about evidence and making those arguments. So thank you.